educating the next generation. We got our honorary tour guide, Professor Lawrence Cram from the Australian National University. Please welcome. Thank you, Chaim. It was a real pleasure to be obliged to go on a tour through the digital posters to do with educating the next generation. I've been given 15 minutes to summarise what I saw during that tour. I should say that I didn't restrict my tour just to that part of the digital posters, and of course there are many posters in other areas that relate to education as well. I haven't tried to assemble them. I hesitated to do this, but I had to classify because I'm a STEM person. <laughs> there are 18 posters uh, in this theme. If I think about the orientation of the posters from the point of view of the kind of students that they're intended for, one poster is a resource for secondary teachers, uh, five pertain predominantly to undergraduates, 11 to postgraduates, and two are resources for general higher education uh, teaching. If I think about it in terms of the focus of the field of study that's being uh, dealt with in terms of education, two in health, two in what I'd think of as public policy, um, seven have no particular application in any domain, and nine, which surprised me, are in what I call EES, environment, ecology, sustainability. It surprised me because there, there seemed to me to be a relatively large number, number there. Uh, you'll notice they don't all add up. I am numerate and I classified some in two different categories. I thought it might be useful to just have a couple of focusing questions as we go through, um, which tended to come out of the posters themselves. Uh, what do the posters tell us about learning and teaching in implementation and in, in, integration and implementation studies? And what can we learn from long-standing interdisciplinary teaching and learning in areas that are relatively invisible these days because they came, they, they went through their struggles of integration and inter interdisciplinary activities a century ago, subjects like engineering, medicine and business. What I'm going to do now is just spend a few seconds, a few tens of seconds, on each of the 18 posters. Forgive me if you own the poster that I go so quickly. Forgive me if I miss the point, um, but there will be a question time afterwards. So the, first, the first poster is uh, from the, um, the CCES at Zurich and its purpose was to develop teaching materials for secondary teaching in uh, environmental, ecolo ecological and sustainability areas. What I really liked about the thrust here was that the materials were seriously confronted with education and theory and quality controlled and it was pretty obvious to me that if you were a teacher calling on those resources in your classroom practice you could be pretty confident that they were very very good materials possibly as good as they can be. The next poster was a very interesting one about the creation of a program at the Department of Integrated Environmental Sciences at Bethune Cookman University. What I took home from this was that that university has particularly close relationships with some field stations and it's an excellent opportunity for service learning to be used in the curriculum and I think it would be very exciting to be an undergraduate uh, in these programs. The next program, uh, an Australian program from our colleagues at uh, UNSW uh, Canberra, is about how to take field work uh, with classes that are made up of people who are actually cadets for the military forces and inspire them to think about things that they might not think about in other contexts such as complexity and integration. I thought the, the thrust of the course was great but what I really took uh, away from this poster that I picked up in other posters as well is just how important it is when one's trying to get these unusual courses underway to have institutional and collegial support for something that's um, a little bit out of the box. And I think I saw that very few of the posters that were presented had actually encountered significant opposition. Of course, the evolutionary success, uh, selection processes might have already occurred. The next uh, poster, which is 
one that I'm associated with, as well as a program at the Australian National University that promotes interdisciplinary education. There are four quite large programs there that take elite students from this university and expose them to complexity, uh, how knowledge is created, leadership and mobilising research. I won't say anything more about that except it's a great poster. Um, <laughs> The next, the next poster, uh, even closer to home, so Kelvin is, is a student in, in the course in the Vice-Chancellor's course that I'm currently giving. And uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to talk to somebody who's got an awareness of cross-cultural issues and deep integrity. And I, I still learn from Kelvin just how much is involved in the struggle of understanding the way that people from culture A might deeply think about a topic and how difficult it is to come to understand uh, that topic in, in say, my, my culture. And uh, it's a wonderful learning experience to, to pick that up. Next poster is uh, from an, a cluster of activities in the uh, public health area at Berkeley, uh, 20 years of experience in offering these kinds of programs. And I think the poster is a salutary indication that once you get it right, it really does work. Uh, there's a component there to do with a 10-year Doctor of Public Health program and a Health Research in Action centre that's got a lot, of, um, a lot of track record. The Community Action Research Track, CART, is an interesting program for uh, medical uh, cross-disciplinarity. Uh, which, which focuses on taking the students, both clinic, uh, medical students and um, allied health students, into the communities of practice and to become aware of what it's like to actually work with the clients of those professions. It looked to me like a program that's um, relatively, uh, well, it's a, a very successful program in an area that's not practiced as much in Australia as, as I suspect might, might be happening in the future. I'm now moving over to um, the very relatively large number that had to do with postgraduate work in the environment, ecological and sustainability areas. Um, the paper on teaching competencies, competencies for transdisciplinary research was very interesting. It was hooked onto a T and the vertical and the horizontal arms of the T carried through the whole poster in a way that I thought would be both it's useful for the reader of the poster, but it would also be quite fun to be in a class setting like that where there was a way for the teachers to take it back to the structure of what was, was happening um, in, uh, as, as the development of the students takes place. The next poster was a second one from the CCES in, in Zurich, uh, a very successful winter school for both PhD students and postdoc students, which confronts those students with uh, real world experiences, but in a place where they can reflect on the nature of the interaction with the, uh, with the real world. Crossing boundaries, competence-based learning, virtual mobility, presumably because these posters relate to the Open University in the Netherlands, which of course is one of the leading uh, institutions in the world that understands how to, how to virtualise the learning experience. And uh, I thought the poster was wonderful, but what I took out of it having just about choked on the same problem in the last week myself, is that too much complexity in one of these kinds of courses can in fact make it quite difficult for the students and indeed the teachers to manage the process of learning. Uh, and so I think we learn that um, not being too um, eclectic in the way that materials are brought together tends to um, help the students. On the other hand, if you don't push enough, the students get a little bit too complacent and the teachers get even more complacent. Then there's a few attempts to define uh, competence in terms of practitioners in transboundary research. Uh, this one was, was about that as well and it produced lists that are both useful but actually based on uh, learning that's taking place. And I think, uh, as I'll say later, I think we actually understand uh, certain aspects of the competences required for the practices that we're talking about uh, quite well. 
The next poster was quite interesting because it dealt with two very concrete situations. One, a PhD candidature in co what I call coastal planning, and another one in uh, the policy implications of biofuels. And the, the students who wrote the poster were actually very reflective on some of the challenges that would occur. Uh, particularly, of course, as a PhD student, you do worry about the examination of your thesis. And if you're working in an intrinsically interdisciplinary area, you might well have uh, to have some confidence that the system will actually support you in terms of, in ter in terms of the examination. Uh, another uh, study of the competencies that are required, uh, quite, a, quite a detailed and long-standing um, investigation into the kind of skill sets, the knowledges, the technical skills that are required to work in, uh, work in these um, fields. Uh, this one was a little bit different. Um, not so much the skills that are required to work in integration and implementation sciences, but with a strong focus on adult, what we call in Australia, adult education, but not teaching adults, teaching people how to teach adults, which is a skill that, uh, that the poster claims, and I think with some accuracy, that we tended to, to uh, take our eye off in Australia. The purpose of, of the course is to actually help the general citizenship become more aware of, of what's going on in, in their society through uh, citizenship education programs. And then finally, two posters that are connected uh, to one another. There's actually six posters in the, se in the series um, which lay out uh, a rather different view, iconoclastic view, I guess wouldn't be an inappropriate way to call it. Um, and in this particular case, I, uh, it's not a quote from the poster, but I went and read <laughs> the um, documents that lie behind the poster. And, and I rather like, but am somewhat, um, I, I guess, uh, bemused by the idea of the modern generalist being somebody who uh, achieves the ability to understand everything. Uh, then the last two posters about, that are not about aiming towards course material but are about resources. Um, this one uh, is, is a poster about the use of a system of pipes and pumps and vessels that can be used to render plausible, uh, quite difficult to understand ideas. Its orientation in this particular application is towards the build-up of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, something that at first sight seems like a simple thing to understand, but actually it's quite complicated. And this uh, tool can be used to study that or any other form of stock and flow type system. And then a book, which was mentioned this morning as well, Interdisciplinary Research Journeys, a wonderful, excellent book of which I've managed to download a wonderful little clause there about Watson and Crick being, well, Crick at least being an interdisciplinarian. And, and I don't know whether anybody who wrote that book is here, but I really, really would like to get the copy that I paid for last week as, as an iBook, and I haven't yet managed to get that from the publishers. So let's come back to the two questions that I thought might help focus the discussion. The first one, what do the posters reveal about learning and teaching in I2S? I didn't get any impression that, we have, that we're struggling to understand the knowledge and skills that are required to operate in this, in this area. I think there was a, a set of posters that by and large had the same kind of content there. I think of that as, let's say, the curriculum. The question about the levels of competency I thought was a lot more unsure and maybe doesn't, doesn't matter, but you know, how much mathematics, how much um, you know, emotional intelligence do you need to work in these areas and how do you teach those things? That's a slightly harder question, but it's a harder question in even disciplinary context just as well as these ones. The other thing I took out of this was uh, the way that education becomes contextualised in this area, I think um, it might be quite hard to teach even at the postgraduate level if it was decontextualised, which, which is an observation coming back to Gabriel's discussions this morning about whether there's a new discipline here. Um, but 
it seemed to me that the educational experience for the students was almost always placed into a context and that the students would have found that very, very motivating and very enriching. You should turn your phone off, I think. Yeah, Mr Block has called me again. <laughs> um, of course, the, the downside of contextualisation uh, and um, placing it in a context is the question about whether the skill sets can be actually transferred into other, other sets, and I, I know that that's, that's a topic, whether they can be and whether they should be. The second focusing question that I thought we might talk about is whether we can learn from the invisible interdisciplinary <laughs> topics. Um, I'm probably going to offend almost everybody in this room um, as an engineer. Um, but I think engineering has always thought of itself as an integrating um, interdisciplinary subject. Medicine, uh, the practice of medicine needs to do that. And in more recent decades, the practice of business and the nature of a business school curriculum is also quite integrating. In each one of those cases, the educational experience seems to me to involve a concentration on some enabling disciplines. You know, maths, physics, chemistry was once taught in engineering. And then, at a, once the enabling disciplines have been half ticked off as being something that students are comfortable with, um, some general transdisciplinarity and integrative activities, which may or may not be called that, in a medical degree you might just call it clinical practice, but it does have that integrative characteristic to it. And then the third stage seems to me to be that most of those practitioners become very, very specialised in some particular area. So for example, an engineer might become a civil engineer or a chemical engineer. Um, whether there's anything that we could learn from that about what it might mean to have a mature uh, discipline called integration and implementation studies, I, I, don't, I don't know. But it seems to me that that's a journey that's been taken more than once and has produced very successful stabilised professions. The other comment that I'd make is that um, credentialing for the stabilised profession becomes really important and I suspect that there's a hand in glove kind of relationship between the development of the curriculum, the professionalisation of the curriculum and then the credentialing of it. And uh, in the case of engineering, for example, and medicine's not far from this either, engineers have the Washington Accord so that an engineering degree offered by a university in many countries around the world will be recognised by the accrediting authorities in another country because the uh, approving authorities uh, tie together those practices. Um, it would be fair to say that engineers, medical people, even business people, think that their professions are much more important than the things we're talking about. That, of course, is a symptom of the fact that they've been around for a long time. What we're talking about here is equally important and possibly even more important because it overarches those, those other disciplines. And it may well be that we're getting close to the time where the, the idea of at least some mechanism for tying together credentialing in this area at an international level wouldn't prove too offensive to, um, say, the owners of universities. So that was, um, that was my tour, and I think we can have some discussion now. Thanks very much. Thank there seem to be a lot of posters, and I hope you remember what they are. However, <laughs> yeah, Lawrence has nicely summarized and discussed those um, posters. So we've got about 10 minutes for discussion. And uh, if you'd like to comment anything for the poster owners who are here or who are online, please take this time. Linda, please. Uh, Linda Neuhauser, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Lawrence, I loved your tour. I, I also looked over all the posters and uh, really appreciated the way your insights and uh, the way you organize the comments. Uh, I will just add a few more of my own from looking at the posters that uh, some people commented on how complicated it is to develop competencies, how many rounds it takes. Uh, and I think that's something uh, that probably many of us here who are teaching in this area have been thinking about, that it's, it's difficult in any discipline, but it's many more times that when you 
are looking at something interdisciplinary. Another comment I liked was about the need to start this kind of education much earlier than college. And my own view is that if we can start um, this maybe with very young children, I'm talking about maybe five or six years old, then maybe we will set the stage for people thinking this way throughout their lives. I think some of us who do this training, we have to do a lot of untraining. We have to do a lot of unlearning of uh, the disciplinary boundaries and the cognitive and social boundaries. So it would be nice to start out a different way. And I, I would be quite interested too if there are people online who have models to share and like to talk about that. We'll have a session also tomorrow where there'll be opportunities to do that. Thanks very much, Linda. Just, just a couple of observations there. Um, in terms of the competencies, it's, it's perhaps superficial, but it is said, and it is evidence-based, that it takes about 10,000 hours to build up high levels of expertise. It's known that that's not true in all cases. But I think that that's why there's no accident to the fact that professional training between the bachelor, the master's, possibly the PhD, is around a decadal period of, of training. And so I would have thought that the answer to your first point, or at least an issue in terms of your first, first point, is that immersion in these kinds of matters for about a decade may well be what, <laughs> it's the thing that induces confidence, but it may be necessary for that to occur, for the confidence to arise. In terms of starting earlier, we used to do that. We used to call science nature studies, and we used to call whatever it's called now geography. Um, I've been recently struck by Michael Young, the philosopher of education from, uh, from London, who's, who's convinced me that behind the difficulty of getting non-disciplinary thinking from preteens is, is the difficulty of breaking down the way that the disciplines situated in universities take hold of the school curriculum. And I think the only solution I can see to that problem, if it's a problem, is for Gabriel to get our, for us to get ourselves a discipline and then take control of the discipline that's needed to hide the disciplines uh, in, the, you know, in the primary school levels. Thank you. So we've got gentlemen here, uh, Gerald, and followed by Susie, please. Yeah, um, Howard Gadlin, NIH. So it, it strikes me as curious that a group of people who spend so much time in systems thinking, uh, when we turn to talking about education, focus on competencies, and it seems especially on the competencies of individuals. And uh, it makes me nervous that we do that because the kind of work we're talking about people doing is work that they're going to be doing in groups. The people who make up those groups, researchers, are not people who have for the most part been distinguished by their emotional intelligence or their interest in working collaboratively and collectively with other people. And it seems to me that the focus in developing competencies has to take place at a group level rather than at an individual level. And I'm skeptical even about the possibilities of introducing early schooling training in this kind of stuff in the same way that I remember 20 years ago there was this fantasy that if only children in schools would learn conflict resolution skills, they'd grow up to be more civil people and they wouldn't engage in wars. And you see how well that's worked out. So I'd appreciate your comments. So. So I, I guess I've got a tiny reputation for just disagreeing for the sake of disagreeing, so let me do that. Um, so, but the class that I've been giving in mobilising research has been fascinated by the literature that I presented to them on the personal qualities that you find in a statistical sense in people who are creative um, contributors to academic research or creative contributors to artistic enterprise, selfishness, 
failure to cooperate with other people, wanting to get on and do their own things, those characteristics seem to be associated with success in those enterprises, but I think that it's success measured by norms that would be pretty hard to argue with. Uh, Crick himself talks about that. Uh, you know, he talks about the boredom of being associated with the biologists. Crick wanted to be Crick. So I'm sure you wouldn't be saying it, but I'd want to see some competencies related to awareness when operating in groups, but I'd also want to see some competencies that are not group oriented in a balanced program. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Gerald Midgley. I wanted to pick up on Linda's point about can we do this from the age of five? And um, I was really excited when I went to live in New Zealand and found that the curriculums in school are all based around 20 thinking skills. And the idea is that the children learn these thinking skills and they have to apply them in every lesson uh, across all the disciplines right from the age of five. So my daughter went into school at, at the age of seven and um, I was really excited to follow up with this. And one day she came back from school and, and I said to her, what did you do today? And she said, oh, thinking skills again. <laughs> And I thought, well, the fundamental relationship between student and teacher hasn't changed. The, 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 the hidden curriculum is still there, basically, that the teacher knows what, 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 what's needed and will tell the students. And unless that changes, unless you have much more student-centered education, then it doesn't matter how, how you, much you change the curriculum. It's the hidden curriculum that matters. Yeah, I, I think that's right. In fact... You, the age groups that you're picking is fascinating. My guess is that the naivety and the lovely enthusiasm of the very young last till they're about eight or ten, <laughs> and then the schools set in, <laughs> and maybe you get to be happy and independent again by the time you get to about my age. Lina, <laughs> uh, would like to respond? I'm really enjoying the discussion. And uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, Howard, you, you mentioned the personal and group. And one thing I found very interesting in the posters is that uh, some of the posters talking about competencies um, mentioned competencies that relate to both personal skills and group skills. So the posters were very intriguing and tantalizing uh, but I would have liked to learn more about, for example, these group skills. And secondly, I, I love the comments about um, young people, and, and I think the worry about spoiling the kinds of creativity. I think of very young people as maybe the most creative humans we have, and if only we can tap into that creativity. And it's very easy to spoil that by maybe doing something like thinking skills. But if there were some way to do what we're talking about here, put very young children in a context of dealing with a problem, and then see what they naturally come up with, um, and uh, see how reflective they might be about that. And just, uh, I would call that sort of a natural process, what would happen? I've had uh, a few of those experiences myself, working with very young children, and it's just amazing the things that they come up with. So I think they could be a source of learning for us, but we'd have to do that in a way that didn't constrain that, that innovation. And I'm not sure I've seen anything much um, formally written about that. If anybody knows of anything, I'd be uh, very interested in seeing that. I think that's a wonderful comment. I have nothing to add. Thanks. Um, uh, Susie Goff here. Um, I'm sort of building on a bit of what's been talked about, um, this kind of concept of the hidden curriculum, um, uh, I just want to make comment about two things that you identified in those slides. One to do with the notion of transferability and the other to do with the notion of credentialing. Um, Goober and Lincoln have done a lot of discussion on the notion of transferability and replaced that our concept with the notion of diffusion. And I think it's not just a semantic issue, 
it's actually a human rights issue. It's one that actually means that no authority comes into another context with the presumption that solutions in point A work in point B and that the way in which we um, do what is called transferring skills is done through negotiation and dialogue and learning. It's a dynamic process of interpreting from one context into another. So um, I really wanted to point that out and sort of suggest the language and the thinking behind the language of an instrumental and generalised approach really needs to be very carefully and cautiously scrutinised when it comes to bringing the power of the institution to supporting if we go in the direction of a discipline and everybody knows my position on that one. The second one is uh, credentialing and honestly as an independent scholar and practitioner of 22 years my blood runs cold at the notion of credentialing. Um, <laughs> now we have fought this in many associations that we've been involved in and that's because it's actually um, uh, there is a place for the people like myself who are out in the field and we deal with um, field-based, market-based opportunities and issues and those processes actually allow for concepts of best practice which are actually way ahead if you can just you know, accept my humility <laughs> in the statement of what an institution with its processes can actually keep up with. Um, and so um, in ALARA, the Action Learning and Action Research Association, what we've come up with with that are distinct points of distinction that are important to consider as principles which then become opportunities for dialogue and learning in any kind of environment that actually help us come to a point of understanding of what we're doing as action learning and action research. It's not criteria and it's not a credentialing process, it's just an opportunity for people to build capacity and connect around those things. I guess what I'm saying is that at the, when we are talking about and working with institutional processes to help strengthen an emerging discipline, it's crucially important that the root metaphor, the unknown and unstated ontological assumptions that sit behind the functioning of that institution and all the processes that we use to bring the best of our intentions to it are deeply, deeply open to self-critical thinking and we do not unknowingly replicate the errors of what has gone before. We just simply don't have the time. So, quite, let me try quickly. So in terms of transferability, um, it seems to me that the uh, diffusion's a lovely word. However, much of the literature about transferability relates quite closely to the idea of the boundary work that disciplinarians do to guard the boundaries of their disciplines. And that's very, very strong. It's almost impossible to count the number of ways that boundary workers protect the boundaries of their disciplines. Transferability, I like the idea that you could sneak across those boundaries by essentially being hidden as you went. <laughs> from one discipline to another, but you'd have to be careful that the boundary riders didn't grab you on the way past. There's a lot of, um, a lot of creation of disciplines wholly through the artificial social construction of the boundaries between them. So we probably have common ground on that one. Credentialing, we, we're about as different as we possibly can be. Um, Joe Stiglitz wrote 40 years ago about why universities give credentials. It's because from an economic perspective, and I hear all the hisses, from an economic perspective, it's one of the lowest cost ways to screen people for their capabilities. Let the universities allow their students to do their very best work. Let the universities accredit those students in terms of the performance for their best work. And then the student acquires the credential, the sticker, and they can go into the world with that process having occurred. I know it sounds horrible, but it's a very good way of describing what's happening. Of course, once you've got the sticker, you can do what you like if you're a brave intellect and have been properly trained. But credentials aren't going to go away. Credentials are not the same as narrow thinking. I mean, if you're having neurosurgeon surgery, you probably would like a neurosurgeon to do it, but you don't necessarily want that person to be doing what was done 100 years ago. I, I think credentials have an important role and it's important not to see them for being more than what they are. 
Thank you so much, Professor Kram.